Become a sustaining member of the Commonwealth Club for just $10 a month. Join today. Hello everyone and welcome to today's virtual program at the Commonwealth Club of California. My name is Jennifer Palmieri. I'm co-host of the Circus on Showtime and a former White House Communications Director under President Obama. And I'm very honored and excited to be moderating this program today. I'm really pleased to be joined by former Australian Prime Minister Julia Gillard, uh, uh, Australia's first female prime minister and former Nigerian minister of finance in Gozi Anganjuo. Uh, can I tell you all, I have been practicing this all day and I knew I would mess this up. I'm so sorry, Ngozi. Ngozi. No problem. Ogo- Anjo Iwala. <laughs> I'm, thank you. Okay. Uh, both uh, Julia and Ngozi are trailblazers and uh, they have teamed up together to write a great new book about women in leadership. It's called Women in Leadership, Real Lives, Real Lessons. Uh, Julia Gillard spent her time in office rebuilding the Australian economy, prioritizing national health initiatives. And Gozi served twice as Nigeria's finance minister, where she successfully negotiated the cancellation of over $18 billion in U.S. 18 billion U.S. dollars in Nigerian debt. Uh, These women led and sought to create a better nation while simultaneously fighting public sexism and gender stereotypes. And women in leadership, um, both uh, Julia and Ngozi offer honest insights into the lives of women politicians who work for a better society while encountering gender discrimination. Um, Women that they spoke to include uh, Jacinda Arden, Jacinda Arden, Uh, Hillary Clinton and Ellen Johnson Sirleaf. This honest book on leadership equality aims to have readers question the role of gender and sexism in the political arena, but I can tell you it has lessons for women no matter which arena you are engaging in. Uh, Lessons for men too. We'll be discussing a lot in the next hour and I want to ask your questions too. So if you're watching along with us, please put your questions in the text, in the text chat on you, text chat on YouTube. And we will get to them later in the program. And I want to thank both of you, Julia and Ngozi, for joining us. I spent a lot of time with Hillary Clinton, as you both know, uh, in planes in 2015 and 16. And she spoke really <laughs> highly of both of you, uh, the work that you did have done, um, and also just some of the great moments that she had with you at these international conferences uh, where it seems like the women might get together and swap some stories and experiences. And as I understand that, that is where you two had the idea for writing this, this book. And so my, my first question to both of you is why, you know, what was it that you really wanted to convey? I, you know, I just wrote a book um, Uh, that's a declaration of independence from man's world. And my sort of fundamental belief was I want women to understand why they have the doubts that they have about themselves so they can move on because I really believe in them. Did you feel like sexism was too prevalent and people, but people weren't talking about it or that women were not seeing what they should see? Like what was the underlying goal here? Well, I'm, I'm happy to start on that and then go to Ngozi. Um, and Jennifer, uh, thank you for your works too, for uh, both the Declaration of Independence and Dear Madam President. Uh, you caused an incident on my local beach. Um, I go walking on my local beach in Adelaide, Australia, uh, listening to audiobooks and podcasts. And I was listening to Dear Madam President at one point and mm-hmm. getting a little bit teary when you talked about your sister and someone came up to me on the beach and said are you all right which was very very nice of them I'm like oh I'm listening to this book um that's so oh that, that's really that's wonderful wonderful to hear wonderful to hear so <laughs> Uh, but for, for me, the motivation in uh, writing our book uh, together particularly was I certainly came out of my experience in politics with a lot of questions in my head about gender and politics. You know, when you're living it in the moment, you often don't have time 
yeah. analyze it. So you get more reflective afterwards. And I was constantly asking myself the questions, you know, how much of what I experienced was about, you know, that era in Australian politics, how much of it was about judgment calls, the government I led made and I made, and how much mm -hmm. of it was simply because I was the first woman to do the job. And you know, that was bubbling in me. And then Ngozi and I increasingly got to know each other at international meetings. Um, I'm the chair of the Global Partnership for Education. Ngozi then was the chair of the Global Vaccine Alliance. We mm -hmm. served on an education commission together. So we were thrown together and we started talking about these questions. And there were so many big events happening in the world right then for women, um, including, of course, what we could see happening with Hillary and the very gendered nature mm -hmm. of the campaigning against her. And so increasingly we thought, we've got to do something about this, we've got to do something about this, what are we going to do about this? Um, and the idea was born to write a book which brought together the research and evidence about women and leadership, but to also put it in the context of the lived experience of eight great women leaders. Right. And we wanted through that to sort of globalise and systematise the debate. You know, it's very hard for an individual woman to come out and say, this happened to me because, you know, often people will say, oh, she's just complaining about something that happened to her. Um, and it's right. hard to get traction on these issues globally. So, you know, Australians might know about something that happened to me. Brits might know about something that happened to Theresa May. But you don't often get the bringing together and the compare and contrast right around the world. So we wanted the book to do that, to give women permission to speak because it wasn't just them and to make sure that this was a book that spoke across cultures and contexts. Yeah, because there is a lot of, com I and mean, that's really a smart way to approach it, because otherwise I do think it, you you, they, you feel like women are just um, that, I mean, people are so sure that they're not sexist, they're blind to gender bias. So they just think it's that woman that's having the problem. And seeing these eight women, all world leaders, people like Hillary Clinton and Theresa May and Ellen Johnson Sirleaf and um, just in the art and they, they, there, there really was a commonality that was interesting to me, but Ngozi, did you approach it from an, a, a position of hope that, um, or optimism for women that, I mean, you seem to have the sense, I know that part you said that, uh, a lot of young women come to you looking, uh, look, they look to you as a mentor and there's only so many women you can take on as a, as projects and that this book is sort of a manual for them. But is it, you know, are you optimistic about the women, uh, women's future? And is that how you're approaching the book? Um, yes, uh, I'm optimistic about women's future, but, but um, I'm also in a hurry. I think <laughs> that if we, <laughs> if we continue in, at the pace we're going, it will take us years and years. I think one of the things we, we wanted to see based on the experience that we had, which was not always uh, easy, even though I told people it's a privilege to have been able to serve my country. You know, you ask why political leadership, even business leadership, why is it so gendered? Why is it that only 57 countries out of the 193 UN United Nations members have had women leaders? Uh, why yep. is it that in any given year, it's like 13 or 14 leaders that we, we have? I mean, some people might say there's progress because it, there were four in 2000 and now we have 13 or 14. But just look at the pace at which, you know, you know, only 57 countries. Then you ask yourself, why is it that only 6.6% .6 of Fortune 500 CEOs are women or 6% of the FTSE 100? So these are the, the issues that we're asking. Why is leadership so gendered? And what is the experience? How can we help women leaders also put their experience in a broader context uh, and see that they are not alone uh, and their lived experience, as Julia put it, has, is the same. They can find similarities, even with women at the top, at top. And the women don't know it all. That's the interesting thing. You know, when people it's see- such a good lesson. One of the lessons that you have in the book is don't yeah. expect women, don't eat women, even at the highest levels. When Julia Gilliard is the prime minister of Australia, it turns out she didn't have exactly all of the answers. I worked for Barack Obama. He didn't have all the answers when he was president of the United States. Is that women, but women feel like they have to. And I feel like that's like, this there's such good practical advice in here for women is like let go of this notion that you're going to know what what always know exactly what to do 
did you have an experience like that? I guess, I mean, when you were, you're the first finance minister, I mean, you had a different path. Julia and I, I mean, I'm not the first prime minister of anything, <laughs> but, but we started in politics. And so her path that she described is very familiar to me. When I started work in the, I started work, I graduated from college in 1988. So I started working in the late eighties. And I thought that the sort of women's rights movement was done, right? It was over. It was solved. I, I thought I would, I might have to work harder than the men, but that we all sort of agree, but that we would get there. We'd all eventually catch up. And, um, and then about 20 years in, I looked around and had the same, you know, just went, looked at the stats that you just named and talked about people like Hillary, like we're not getting there. We're not making that kind of progress. Um, but what did you expect when you came into the workplace? You started from the financial um, and, you know, and I'm like on that side of this, of governing, um, what did you expect your life was going to be like as a woman in that industry? And, and how did it play out? Is it similar to what Julia, you know, relays in the her side of the book? Well, a little bit different in the sense that I had no illusions, um, mm-hmm. you know, that uh, things were going to be all right and, and we were done. No, I, I didn't feel that. Mm -hmm. Um, But I thought that things would move a little faster uh, than they have with respect to women uh, positions uh, in in leadership. Um, And, um, you know, being the first female finance minister was a lot of pressure uh, in the job. And I was just focused on making sure because this had never happened. And there were people who felt this is a powerful job. Why is a woman in it? You know, it was really there. I write about it in my other book. Mm-hmm. And so I felt the pressure to make sure I delivered. And, and uh, because if I didn't, then women would be done. So there was a lot of that pressure. And I felt if we are to go faster, I absolutely have to show that women can deliver on this job and, and, and do it well. And I'm happy to say that in my country, after my service, we've had three female finance ministers since then. So it really did deliver in terms of showing uh, uh, that, that there could be. We can do it. And uh, there should be no reason why we shouldn't be in that job. That's how it is in, in, in America with the Secretary of State, because Condoleezza, because Madeleine Albright was the Secretary of State, Condoleezza Rice was the Secretary of State, Hillary Clinton was the Secretary of State. One of my uh, colleagues from the Obama White House, their daughter said something about when John Kerry became Secretary of State. Said, but I thought only women could be Secretary of State. Why are they letting boys do it? But boys can do it too. Um, <laughs> Julia, well, we, are, we are certainly ahead of the U.S. in Nigeria because you're just getting your first female finance minister in Janet I'm Yellen. Right? Janet Yellen, this is the first one, and we have our first, and we have our first female vice president, um, which is. Uh, which is, which is, uh, it was remarkable to see yesterday they had a meeting um, with a Republican senators about a COVID relief bill. And it was the first time I had seen our new vice president in, you know, sort of a, a relatively casual setting, which was sitting in the Oval Office. You know how if you're looking at the Oval Office, the president is in the chair on the right and the vice president is in the chair on the left. And there she is, you know, our first <laughs> Black woman biracial uh, vice president of the United States doing her job. Uh, it was like, it's really exciting. Yeah. Um, but Julia, when you, like, there was a lot that I related to when you were describing your like way up in politics and you said that, um, you know, cause I, I sort of knew I needed to get along with men and I enjoy working with men and I had good male colleagues, but I was also sort of aware of, am I playing the guy's game too much? And I, I think you said, you know, someone had to like pushed you on this. Was like, did you get to be prime minister by playing the guy, the boys game and playing it a little too well? So can you, can you talk about what that in, in real time, what it was like for you coming up? And then sort of at some point you had this reflection that, Oh, because I, I just thought it was the way the world was. And then I realized, Oh, what I'm doing is modeling myself after the men and trying to fit into their world. And that's probably part of the reason why we keep hitting these glass ceilings, but tell us about your Yeah, absolutely. And I uh, think this is an important question for us all to be talking about uh, now, about how much we want to 
current power structures and how much we want to change current power structures. Mm -hmm. Uh, For me, you know, I'm uh, sitting in my hometown of Adelaide, Australia. This is where I grew up. Uh, I went to school here. I got to go to university here. That wasn't a, you know, usual thing for the Gillard family. Uh, So I thought it was a real privilege. And, you know, my journey into politics really started at Adelaide University. I got involved in a campaign against government funding cutbacks and then I got involved in the student union and then got involved at the national level and on and on it went. And like you, I made the assumption kind of early on that, yes, life was still different for women, but it was changing fast and, you know, I could be part of that change and contribute to that change but I would easily live to see a time, in fact, I'd spend most of my working life in a time when gender equality had happened. And mm-hmm. so I'm of that generation of Labor women that we fought for the affirmative action rule to bring more women into Parliament. It made a huge difference. You know, when we got the rule in the early 1990s, uh, the number of women going into Parliament from the Labor Party was like 14%. Now, the national parliament, the state parliaments around the nation, the Labor team is generally around 50%. So things have changed. But I also, yeah, which is fantastic. Better than the US. (laughs) Uh, and better than the other side of politics which hasn't gone for an affirmative action target. So it does show even in the Australian environment that it can make a big difference. Mm -hmm. But I certainly accepted Uh, political structures as I found them. So, you know, the essence of prospering in the Labor Party is you've got to, um, you know, there are factions, tendencies, you've got to be able to work rooms, you've got to be able to work numbers. So I did all of that. I got into what is a very adversarial political environment, the parliament, with our ritualised question time uh, where, you know, everybody really has a go at it. Uh, You know, obviously our parliament is modelled on uh, Westminster, modelled on the House of Commons in the UK, but we've had British members of parliament come and watch our question time and they're like, what on earth was that? (laughs) Because it's so fiery and so combative. And I set out to show that a woman could lead, could dominate in this very adversarial environment. And I don't regret doing that. I think it, it had to be done. Um, Mm -hmm. to show that this is an environment where women can prosper. Yes. She can do the job just the way it's always been done, which means just the way a man has always done it. But she can do that, right? You felt the need to prove that. Yes, and and that, you know, in our politics, you can't come through for leadership unless you can hold your own in this very very contested structure. So Mm -hmm. I had to show that I could do that. I didn't have time or the space as the first woman Uh, to lead Australia, to open up the next set of questions, which is, do we have to do it like this? Right. And I I really think about the contrast between where we are and where New Zealand is. You know, Jacinda Ardern is the third woman to lead her nation. Um, No one in New Zealand, uh, least of all Jacinda Ardern, when she was thinking about politics, and she said this clearly in our book, she never thought that, I can't do this because I'm a woman. You know, she knew women could do this. She'd seen Helen Clark do it for a decade or more. You know, that question had been answered. She was asking herself a set of questions about, can I do this, the sort of individual I am? Can I do this? But being the third to come to the job, she's, you know, got the space to answer, to ask those next round of questions, which is, can we have a political structure that works with kindness and empathy at the foreground because that's the kind of leader that I want to be. And she's made that the watchwords of her leadership, kindness, empathy, but she's very clear that that's part of her as an individual but also part of the political space she inherited because, you know, they're beyond the question of can women do this and they're asking those deeper questions about what's the different way of doing this. And I think your work, Jennifer, causes us to look at those questions, those sort of second round questions uh, about how else can we do this and allow people in all sorts of styles to be uh, leaders. And, you know, I've often joked, I think, you know, we'll know we've got to, to gender equality 
when a woman who presents for political office say, you should elect me because I'm the hardest bitch in town and I get things (laughs) done, she can get elected. And the man who comes forward and says, you know what, you know, what's central to me is I like to be really kind and to have really high performing teams. And, you know, if I was your leader, then that's the kind of leader I would be. When we when we can mix it all up so no one is je- judging anyone through the prism of gender, that's when we know that we've got to gender equality. The, uh, I mean, this is a, the, when, with the, Hillary's experience, it's that, you know, I, I feel like we had to, we had to prove that she would do the job, could do the job the same way as it, as it all has been done, right? And then you're like, well, that's how a man would do it. We had to put her on stage with Donald Trump, prove that she could hold her own there, not get flustered, right? And then people come back at her and they say, well, why isn't she, why can't she show any emotion? Why, why can't, you know, and that, that's where you get to the next, you know, the next generation. And I find, you know, we didn't, uh, uh, a woman didn't win the Democratic nomination for president in 2020, but we had a lot of candidates. We had six candidates that were on the debate stage, six women. Um, and they were doing it all their own way and they were being judged differently, right? They're being judged, you know, there was still sexism and gendered coverage and all that, but it was much, it was much better. But in Gozi, the, um, Julia had mentioned, we you know, one of the you all put hypotheses in the books from based off of the conversations that you had with these women leaders about things that might sort of help them get a good start, like you go girl, like having as a young girl been um, been taught to you know been raised to believe that you could you could do um, anything. Mm-hmm. Um, so I, I, and it's interesting. It does seem that does seem to be a commonality. That was something I know from talking with Hillary that she thought also her parents, interestingly, she has, she told me she has never felt insecure about her looks. Um, And even though, you know, her wardrobe and her hair was constantly, uh, you know, commented upon, to say the least, (laughs) it didn't, you know, it bothered her that they weren't talking about issues, but she was confident and secure in like who she was and what she looked like and didn't really care. Wasn't um, because of that rearing as a young girl. Um, so can you, can you, I know you've said like, can you talk about why that's important or what you found with these other women and empowering yeah. girls? Well, I think Jennifer, really, you set it out uh, very well. Um, one thing common to all the women was that in growing up, nobody ever told them they couldn't do things boys could do. And was this true in your experience too, Ngozi, when you were growing up? Absolutely, absolutely. My experience as well, and and in in Julia's experience, and in in my experience and my culture, the first child, well, I'm sure it's in other cultures too, is expected to, to, um, you know, be, I don't want to say a leader, but to show a good example uh-huh. Uh, to all the others. And, and that means you have to be able to do uh, so many things. But in essence, I had parents that believed that there would, should be no difference between the boys and girls. I actually thought they expected more of us. We are two girls, myself mm-hmm. and my sister, who expected to do a lot more than the boys. They got away with a lot more. Um, so so, so I, I feel that if you look at the experiences of all the women, you look at Ellen Johnson Sirleaf, uh, who was fearless as, as growing up. She yeah. felt she could do any and everything that the boys could do. You look at Christine Lagarde and you see her the first of, I think, three or four, uh, three boys. So there were four. And, you know, she was expected to be in charge. Uh, you know, so you if you look at each and every one of them, there wasn't this questioning. You've mentioned yes. Hillary already. There was actually the expectation that, yes. that you could do this. So we believe that the kind of nurturing uh, that you get as you're growing up, uh, the environment you grow up in uh, matters a lot. Um, it matters, and it's, it's such a great piece of advice because anyone can, that's something any parent can do right now, <laughs> no matter what else changes in society. If you empower your children, girls and boys both to believe they can like that that really does take hold and sort of inoculates these women against other, um, you know, other obstacles they're going to encounter. That another thing that, um, Ngozi, that you, um, uh, that I, I think that you, you know, 
I think your finance minister, the first, your first year as a finance minister was sort of, maybe not quite the situation, but um, talk about the glass cliff. I think a lot of people, people have heard about glass ceilings and I think glass cliffs is sort of when a woman is like, sure, you can be in charge now that everything's a mess. <laughs> and uh, they walk into really, you know, I, I, you know, Mary Barra in the United States who walked into GM when GM was not in great shape. This is uh, something that we have seen repeated, particularly in business in the U.S. Uh, but I don't think people really know that term. Um, so tell us about that. And if you do feel like your experience as finance minister was a, a yeah. run, a trial run of, uh, of you know, the glass cliff. Well, you know, you said that people usually know glass ceilings, uh, but glass cliffs where exactly when things are not going so well, that's when women are called in. And if you look at our women leaders, uh, they've had many glass cliff moments and, um, uh, my favorite one is uh, when Christine Lagarde was a partner at Baker McKenzie and the mm -hmm. firm was going through so many troubles. Uh, so none of the men wanted to touch it and they came to her to try and pull it all together and she foolishly accepted to do it. <laughs> <laughs> and was asking and she did yes. it. You know, yeah. so in my own career, I've had uh, quite a few glass cliff moments. Uh, even as a, a young, a, a fairly junior person at the World Bank, they were, I remember one particular mission where it was a mess. Nobody wanted to lead it and I got the chance. Um, but as the Minister of Finance, yes, in a sense, uh, you could call it a glass cliff moment in the sense that too, my president said he brought me there so we could get debt relief. We had $30 billion in debt and I had to, and we were, debt service was about $2 billion a year. And it was getting very expensive. I had to figure out how to get around and get rid of that. I think the second thing was the economy was growing at about 2.3%. And, and with a population growth rate of about 2.5, we were having, you know, sort of negative, negative per capita growth. And that wasn't good enough. So the other thing was, how do we lift the economy? So mm -hmm. it, it, that very, very uh, tough issues. But, um, you know, putting together a good team, uh, with the backing of the president, we were able to do it. We got debt relief, 30 billion wiped off, of which 18 billion was, you know, uh, completely uh, wiped off. Mm -hmm. uh, and 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 we our economy tripled in growth, almost to six percent during during my time as finance minister. So we met that glass cliff, but it was very tough going, and there was always this feeling that if you, if I don't do it. Uh, this is going to be a disaster, not only just for me or the country, but for women. Right. Uh, so, yeah, a lot of, and, and I joke. But it's, it can be an opportunity too, right? I mean, that's what you've also said. Is um... Absolutely. Julia, Julia puts it uh, very well when she says that, you know, the other thing is that men feel they can get other opportunities. So they often yeah. uh, walk away from yes. a glass cliff. But women feel this may be my only chance. And, and and so they go for it. So that's another thing. And, and that is true. I, I joked elsewhere that uh, perhaps the WTO I'm trying to get to will be the, the biggest glass, glass cliff moment I ever have in my life. <laughs> 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 the, uh, I did. Uh, yeah, when 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 Theresa May became becomes prime minister after Brexit falls apart and keeps falling apart, and then yeah, then the conservatives in the UK are like, here, you try it. It's like, oh, I didn't know. I didn't know that I had. A, I didn't know that was called class cliff. But I definitely understood what was what was happening there, <laughs> Jennifer. I think I think it's important just where this term comes from. Uh, yeah. It raises an important issue. It it comes from research which was take under which was undertaken um, after the Times, you know, the very established newspaper, the Times of London, uh, had published a piece saying uh, women CEOs uh, cause low share prices. So they'd done a simple correlation, businesses with women CEOs, low share prices, women CEOs are the problem. Mm -hmm. And researchers came along and unpacked all of that and said, no, 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 no. What's <laughs> happening here is low share prices, businesses in trouble appoint women CEOs. Um, so, you know, if a business is going well, 
male CEO, you keep that male CEO, you've got to get another CEO, you get one a lot like him, another man. If it's going badly, then you say, oh, let's try something completely new. Oh, I know, we've never had a woman. Um, and, <laughs> and the reason it's important to understand that is whilst many women step forward for a glass cliff moment like Ngozi did or Christine Lagarde, um, mm-hmm. you know, and, and make a success out of it, uh, many women will step forward for a glass cliff moment and it'll still be a big problem. The business won't right, go well or the politics won't go well. Mm-hmm. People would say that looking at Theresa May, the politics right. of Brexit didn't go well. And we've just got to be clear, cause and effect. Otherwise, people will walk away saying, oh, I knew she couldn't do it. And if she right. couldn't do it, maybe they women generally can't do it. So we've got to be really clear that often women are only given permission to lead when it's pretty close to mission impossible. <laughs> yeah, which is why you should give women permission to lead, uh, you know, when, when you know, which is why Kamala Harris is walking into a tough vice presidency because things are hard in the US right now. But that is not a glass cliff moment, right? That is handing the baton of leadership to a woman that's just ready to lead and be a good partner. Um, but it's, this is what's so great about this book and, you know, the, the practical advice in it is you're shedding specific light on a specific problem with an action for what women should, should do about it, which, um, you know, not, not all books accomplish that. Um, Julia, the hypothesis of she's a bit of a bitch. <laughs> it's okay. This is one of the chapters, friends. I'm just, <laughs> just saying, um, but uh, you wrote that you thought as the first female uh, prime minister that you might encounter some sexism early on, but that would abate. And instead it got <coughs> worse. And that was certainly my experience with Hillary. And I, I think it's because with her coverage, because no one, reporters don't want to be sexist, don't think they're sexist. So I think that makes all of us, men, women, report, not just reporters, but sort of blind to the gender biases that we all hold in our heads because we have these role models in our heads. And what I found was her press coverage just compounded. It kept getting worse because it was, you know, it was sort of like they were suspicious of her and then they got more suspicious of her and gender could never be part of it because then that would unravel every all the work they had done previously. Um, but this with you... I, I, it, you know, my impression is that kind of coverage and sort of sexist attacks sort of built up to the point where you gave what is known as the misogyny speech. And um, most people in America, I think most women in America are not familiar with this. So I want you, can you, can you explain what was happening that drove you to give this speech? Tell us a little bit about it and, and, the, and the reaction. I think it's really important for it's really important for people to hear about about this. It is a remark. I mean, I went back and reread it today. It's remarkable, remarkably bold, direct, like all the things women are told not to do when they're talking about (laughs) sexism and gender. Right. But you just you did it and had such a big impact. So tell us. Yeah, I'm I'm happy to uh, talk about that. But uh, the foundation stone of all of this is. Um, me making an error in thinking that, you know, when I became Prime Minister, that everybody would be very focused on the fact that I was the first woman in the early days of my Prime Ministership. From both, you know, positive and negative um, perspectives, I I expected that there would be a lot of, you know, you go girl kind of stuff around. That's fantastic. We've got the first woman. This is incredibly meaningful for Australian women and girls. And there was a lot of that. But I also expected the maximum discomfort of people like, oh, I'm not sure. Um, this there's hasn't something happened about before. Her. Yeah, mm-hmm. there's something about her. I'm, I'm a bit uncomfortable. Um, I expected the maximum of that to be in the early period. And then time would pass. I'd just be doing the job. And we've talked about doing the job, hopefully mm-hmm. succeeding in the job. And people would just start concentrating on that. So then the dialogue would move from, you know, she's the first woman to, oh, I really like that healthcare policy or I really hate that schools policy or whatever it is, but sort of politics as usual. Um, what I actually found was 
you know, as I governed, you end up making decisions um, that some people find to be controversial. We particularly decided to enact an economy-wide emissions trading scheme uh, here in Australia as a climate change policy. Australians and Americans vie for being the most carbon intensive people on the planet. So <laughs> this was a big, you know, a big yeah. and controversial policy. And as that political sort of, you know, hurly-burly played out, actually stuff got more and more gendered. The gendered insult became the go-to weapon. There were people, you know, at rallies holding up signs referring to me as a witch and a bitch and things like that. Um, the frame that was put around me was, you know, she's ruthless, she's ambitious, she doesn't have kids, she doesn't understand families. How does she understand what impact all of this is going to have on ordinary family life? Because she's just a ruthless career woman, not a mother, not a nurturer, not a carer. It all played out like yeah, that. Right. Um, and you know, I, because I, in the early days of my prime ministership, had decided I wasn't going to go, look, you know, let's foreground gender because everybody mm -hmm. else was doing that and I thought it would fall away over time. When it got as contested as that, it was hard for me to start foregrounding gender at that moment. And even if I had, people would have said, well, she would say that, wouldn't she? Because now she's trying to distract from the fact that the government's in controversial political times. Right. Um, what ended up happening with what's come to be known as the misogyny speech is the question time that I spoke about before in Australian politics, every parliamentary day, parliament used to sit about 20 weeks a year, four days a week, every parliamentary day, there's an hour and a half where the opposition without notice can ask the government, ministers and prime minister, any question, no notice given at all. And almost always the or overwhelmingly the questions go to the prime minister maybe a few to other senior ministers um it's an incredibly combative time um i actually um uh, had a uh, president obama once said to me that he envied uh the question time structure because you could get your message out to the nation to which i undiplomatically replied are you mad like this <laughs> This is a pretty crazy thing to wish for. Like, this is a blood sport. He would love to take Republicans on directly. If he could argue, if he could, like, just refute <laughs> their arguments in real time, that would that would have... Yeah, he would have enjoyed it, I think. But, yes. <laughs> gee, it's tough. It's really tough. Um, and so there was a, a political incident in Parliament where the man I had spoke, uh, I had supported to become Speaker of the House of Representatives had been unmasked of, as having sent some dreadfully sexist text messages. Not something I could have known at the time I supported him, but, you know, don't let the facts get in the way of a good political <laughs> story. So I walked into uh, Parliament that day thinking the opposition is going to use this question time to try and skewer me as a hypocrite on the question of sexism because I supported this man to be speaker. And after everything I'd listened to about myself, the number of times I hadn't replied, the number of times I'd sort of bitten my lip not to reply, what really welled up in me was cool anger and I was ready to take this on in question time. What actually happened was the opposition, instead of starting to ask questions, moved a motion to have an immediate parliamentary debate. So the misogyny speech is my off-the-cuff reply in that immediate parliamentary debate. And I think you can see the cool anger at work as I sort of finally address all of the sexism and misogyny that I had had to put up with as Prime Minister. And a lot of women, you know, look at that speech and say, um, you know, I could never do anything like that. And my response is, well, one, Parliament's a pretty stylized environment. People don't wander around workplaces quite conducting themselves like that. So don't, <laughs> don't mark yourself down because you're not about to channel Australian question time when you go to work or go to your local community group or even your meeting of your political party locally. But the other thing is I couldn't have done that several years before either. You know, standing and putting your case in the moment, that's a honed craft. I had to hone it in mm -hmm. Australian politics and then I brought it to the fore in that moment. And so I hope that that gives people some comfort that if they are going to start taking sexist arguments on, 
men and women, that, you know, the more you decide I'm going to be upfront about this, the easier it will become the more you do it. You know, these are these are ultimately not innate skills. They're learned skills. They're things that people can get better at over time. And when you're and when you're pushed and you have, you know, if and, and, and right is on your side in the moment, you're going to be able to uh, summon what it is that you really want to say, because I can't believe that you did that off the cuff. Everyone has to go read it and watch it. It is amazing. And I know that I mean, you said that it's gotten so much attention that you feel like it's overshadowed some of the things that um, you have done. I know that with President Obama, um, you know, maybe maybe a sort of you know, sort of a corollary experience is he didn't talk a lot, particularly in the first term about race. Um, and he would not usually talk about his own personal experience. And then after Trayvon Martin, who was a young Florida teenager, it was a young black Florida, Florida teenager was shot by sort of a vigilante. The guy, the guy was tried. Um, the guy who shot him, killed him, was tried and got, was acquitted. And it was just devastating to black Americans. And President Obama went to the briefing room and said sort of for the, you know, sort of for the first time, like, this is what my life has been like as a Black man in America. And it's just like, whew, uh, pretty devastating to hear from him. And I think it's probably remembered as one of his, it was it was not scripted. Um, you know, he just was like, this is what I'm going to say. And he went down the next day and did it. Um, very, but very personal, which she normally didn't do. I experienced this. People said this to me. Um, but I'm, and I, I think that it probably, you know, there are things that he maybe thought he was going to be remembered more for. And it's in that speech is one of the things. But how do you feel in retrospect now, you know, seven, eight years out about having done that speech and the sort of moment, you know, how it is remembered in history? Yeah, it, it's taken me a while to kind of be at peace with it because, uh, in the first few years after I left politics, you know, you think I was in Parliament for 15 years, I was Deputy Prime Minister for three years, I was Prime Minister for three years. We did big things that really mattered to the Australian yeah. community. We had an impact internationally and it apparently all comes down to one speech, you know, and, <laughs> and I did feel a frustration with that. Yeah. Uh, but I would have to say the more I... Um, you know, kind of uh, moved away from my immediate parliamentary career, the more I uh, travelled and did things internationally, um, you know, I would literally be walking down a street in a, you know, uh, London or New York or wherever and a woman would dive across the road to say, oh, my God, Julia Gillard, I watched your speech. And, yeah. and you know, it, it would be apparent after a few minutes' conversation with them that, that's the only thing they knew about me, the only thing they knew about Australian politics. And for most of them, other than the very basics, you know, uh, koalas, big sharks, big spiders, snakes, you know, the <laughs> sorts of things people know about Australia. Um, unfortunately, <laughs> reputation for dangerous animals, despite being a very beautiful, safe place. Um, you know, other than that, it was the only thing they knew about Australia. And, yeah. uh, you know, that helped me settle with it. I thought, well, if, you know, if in this quick look at Australia, this is one of the things they know about us, I'm happy with that. Yeah, it's better than focusing on spiders and sharks. <laughs> <laughs> um, and um, and Gozi, the you you uh, Julia says like in like you all both just wrote a letter at the opening that she's always been sort of a feminist, but you, you, Julia describes herself as sort of an um, analytical feminist early on, and that you feel more more of the emotional tug of feminism. And and Gozi, you described yourself as a as a womanist, and so I wanted you to. Um, which, which, I, which I know actually has American origins, um, but talk about what that means. And you also talk about how networking with other women hadn't been a priority for you in real time, or, um, and, but, but it's something that you feel like being sort of in community with women is important. So can you, can you talk about your experience with those things? Yeah, I think the, the term womanist was coined, yeah, it's an American one by Alice Walker, but it was magnified by my own, very own aunt. I have a, an aunt, Chikwenye uh, Okonjo Gunyemi, who, who was a professor of English at, at Barnard and, uh, sorry, at Sarah Lawrence and, and Columbia. Oh. And she she amplified that term. And, and when I thought about it, I, I wanted to use it to describe myself in the sense that I never cease to be amazed at how women uh, manage to accomplish so many things. Mm -hmm. 
mm-hmm. um, whether it's out here or in my own continent, everywhere. I, I just look at them and I am filled with uh, awe. I'm a woman myself, but when I look at other women and what they can do, I just feel this, you know, feeling of empathy, pride, uh, or at what they can do. Um, juggling so many things at once, uh, whilst uh, trying to a career, you know, sometimes a family, sometimes not, uh, having to cope in gendered environments. So it's that feeling of being proud to be a woman, feeling what women feel and and empathizing with them that makes me say I'm a womanist because I really do relate uh, relate to that. So that that's where that came from. Um, and what about networking with other with other women or trying you know to be I mean Julia you described it you said that you feel like an emotional tug of feminism way that you didn't before but I think it goes you you know I think that this is uh, you wrote about that too. That wasn't something particularly maybe if you're, when you're working in finance, you're one of the only few women, that's not something that's priority, but why is it important? that women well, support I, each other I, that way? You know, I, I think networking is important. Uh, but for me, I think it's networking, both women and men. And, um, you know, we haven't talked about men and we need to, to bring that to the fore that we can't solve uh, this gender gap this gender issue, the gendered environment, unless we have men with us. And one of my dreams about this book is to talk to an audience of only men. <laughs> you know, because, yes. Because I think that they have a role to play. And, um, you know, they, they so I, I networking is good, but, you know, encourage be women, not just to network with women, but network with men and encourage men to feel that they really can do something about the environment we're in. Where they can call it out when they see a sexist or, or gendered moment. Uh, you know, they can mentor women, you know, they can, there's so many things that, that they themselves can do. So it doesn't have to feel like this is all for women trying to solve women's problems. Right. So when you talk about networking, that's how I, I, I come about it. Um, um, but I think it's something that women should not neglect because men do it very, very well. Uh, and that yes. is why they also have an edge because they, they have, if, if it may be golf, you know, they're playing golf, they're networking. You yeah. know, it may be a drink somewhere in some club, they're networking. And and women don't do that and they don't even have the time most of the time. But right. we strongly encourage not to, to get away from it because men do it. Just yeah. broaden the, 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 the number of people and the type of environments in which you do it. The, um, I have questions from uh, the audience now too to share with you. So the first one is for two trail pla- yeah. for two trailblazers. Easy for me to say. What's the most interesting thing you learned from writing this book? I know you had a lot of really interesting conversations with uh, other women leaders. For both of you, what was the most interesting thing you learned? Maybe I can start. Um, well, the first thing was really what we said that no, no leader seem to know it all. Um, because there are times when you say to yourself, you know, am I going through this because I don't know this? And, and that this other leader has figured out all the answers. You know, why did I make these mistakes? And it was quite uh, insightful and refreshing for me to see that every single woman uh, didn't know it all. They didn't have the answers. Even the balancing of work life. Uh, mm-hmm. You know, this is one question that all young women, for instance, have. How did you do it? I have four children. Right. And I was constantly traveling and a spouse. How did you do it? How do you balance? And there's no perfect answer. I, I, I love what Jacinda Dern said. <laughs> the, she said, I just make it work. Right. You know, so <laughs> just also learning that, yes, I made it work. And, and of course, uh, we, we have one or two things. Make sure your partner is supportive of what you're doing. Is a true partner, but really there's no perfect answer. So that's a big lesson uh, that mm-hmm. I learned. Another one, well, I can't say it's a lesson because this is how I deeply feel, is um, there's no way, one way to be a leader. Hmm. Just be yourself. Don't try to change yourself to be something you're not or to copy other people, you know, except, of course, if there's something good you can learn from them that you incorporate in your own style, um, you know, then that, that's a good thing. 
but be yourself because that's what I've been. I've been myself from day one to day 100. And I'm not going to change my appearance or what who I am or the way I talk. So, and it's, if you're, com- I'm comfortable in my own skin. Uh, and I, I ask others to be comfortable. And I just want to add here, you know, we didn't talk too much about issues of women in color, but I want to say before we, we, we leave this, that for every problem that women encounter, uh, women of color feel it even more. You know, there's this pecking order of white men, then black men, then white women, then black women uh, at the bottom. And so for, for those women of color, uh, there's Kamala Harris, you know, she's been through a lot, you know, so there's a lot to learn. Don't, don't let the magnified uh, attention get to you or the magnified abuse, if you want to, to talk about that. So, so those are some, some of the things that I would say. Um, Julie, did you have something you wanted to add about the interesting, most yeah. interesting thing you learned in this? Yeah, when we when we set out on this and wanting it to be a truly global book, one of the questions I, I had in my head, and, and Gozi and I discussed it quite a lot, is how much would we find experiences were in common and how much would we find that they were really different? You know, so when you when you look at the outside yes. and you say, you know, how much really can an Ellen Johnson Sirleaf in Liberia, first president following a civil war, or Joyce Banda in Malawi taking on the presidency after the former president died. Right. Uh, how much can they really have in common with uh, Erna Solberg from Norway, one of the richest countries in the world, or Theresa May in the United Kingdom? You know, how much can Michelle Bachelet, who, um, you know, was tortured herself during the Pinochet regime, lived in exile, came back to be president of Chile, how much can she really have in common with a Christine Lagarde or a Hillary Clinton or a Jacinta Ardern, who have never known that kind of uh, turmoil? and and loss of peace and security. Uh, And yes, culture and context did speak a lot, but what really struck me out of uh, doing all of the interviews and talking to these women is how much there was in common that they experienced simply because they were women. You know, the differential, uh, differential focus on their appearance, the differential focus on their family structures. If they had children, who was looking after the kids? If they didn't have kids, you know, why didn't they have kids? What did that say about them? Uh, For example, I don't have children. Theresa May doesn't have children. Um, I I know when Gozi said that people are saying, how could she possibly do this? She's a mother. How is she neglecting her children? That she's four children. Right. Right. Yeah. Kind of damned uh, if you do. (laughs) <laughs> yeah, damned if you do. I mean, uh, you know, we we talk in the book, you know, there's there for a, a woman who wants to be a leader, there is no right answer to the question, do you have children? Because if you say, yes, I do, then the next question will kind of be, even if it's done via a raised eyebrow and more subtly than a direct question, the next question will basically be, well, how do you think you're going to be able to do this job if you've got kids? Who's going to be looking after the kids? And if you don't have children, then the eyebrow will be raised in the other direction about what sort of woman doesn't have kids and why, you know, does she really understand other women and families if she doesn't have children? Um, and, And the other thing that was in common was each of our women leaders was incredibly conscious that they were on this narrow tightrope uh, where they had to combine strength and empathy. So if they ever Mm. looked too weak and, you know, you spoke before about, you know, Hillary Clinton needing to face up to Donald Trump in debates and people saying, well, look, she handled it very competently, but why doesn't she show some emotion? But yeah. we all know that if she'd been emotional in those moments, people would have said she's cracking up, she's not strong enough to take on the role of president. You know, we thought she yeah. was a pretty tough cookie, but clearly she's pretty flaky underneath. Um, <laughs> so, you know, yeah, you, ha- you have to look strong enough to lead but you can't tip over into looking so strong, so commanding that you offend against the gender stereotype that people expect women to be empathetic and nurturing. 
Right. And in all of these cultures and contexts from, you know, South America, Europe, Africa, my region of the world, in all of these cu cultures and contexts, women were incredibly conscious that they were on that tightrope and they were just, you know, one footfall, the mm -hmm. wrong side away from a disaster. And that is all an extra pressure on their shoulders simply because of gender and gender stereotyping. Yeah. And, and then, and race too. Right. I mean, that's just like, this yeah. is the, um, but what, and, but what do you think? Um, but do you think, and I have a question that's one of the questions from the audience is in this thing too, that yeah, women have felt the need to be just sort of walk that, that, that tightrope, but should, but should, the, should we not now? I mean, should we now just plow forward and one of the, and, and, and not worry as much about trying to be, trying to solve for you have to be both strong and soft and just you know as Ngozi says just be yourself um the question I have from the audience is and facing sexism fairly regularly I weigh whether to put my foot down or to roll through in order to keep moving forward right do you just you call it out or not I guess when do you two think about when to confront sexism versus when to ignore which um you know um and I I this is a, this is a, and I know one of the things that you wrote, Julia, was like, you, you think you should have called it out earlier or more often, but then it, but then, you know, the discussion be, I mean, my, I kind of feel like the discussion will become about sexism and gender and you, you, we've been trying to avoid that, but we can't avoid it anymore. And we probably should call it out, but I don't know. And Gozi, how, how do you feel about this? Question? I think calling out sexism and calling out in a way racism are two problems. When do you know to call it out? Right. Uh, and and uh, of course, and people won't think you're using that as an excuse for everything. Uh, so so I, I developed a kind of lesson for myself. If it's directed at me personally, I, I don't uh, most of the time call it out. If it's sexism or racism, I just move past it because of I said in the book that uh, when I was coming to the United States uh, to go to college at Harvard, my father pulled me aside at 18 plus and said, look, you may encounter some discrimination or racism when you go as either as a, a woman or a black person. And, you know, we don't know that in my country because you don't have it. You grow up not knowing, talking about being black all the time. Right. That's Jim Amanda says, you know, you only get to know you're black when you arrive here. So he, he gave me some advice that I never forgot. And he said to me, if someone discriminates against you or your race or sex, it's their problem, not yours. Use their problem as a strength to do even better. So when I came across this sexism or racism personally in life, even at college, I just walked past it. But for me, when the sexism will affect, is something when I'm in a group and someone does it and it has an impact on a larger group of people. That's when I feel, you know, I feel I need to call it out, especially if you're in a leadership position. May not always be right there, but going to the person and saying that what you did there was beyond the pale uh, and, and should not be repeated. So that's how I've handled it. Calling these out when it impacts beyond me and trying to step beyond it and keep going when it's just a, a directed at me only. If I can add to that, I think there's a, there's also a question of who who calls it out, and this is a question that we do uh, talk about in the mm -hmm. book. We tend in these discussions, should we call it out? Shouldn't we call it out? To put all of the responsibility for that on the woman in the moment, whereas you know that responsibility should be a collective one, right. and it should be very strongly on the shoulders of men as well. Um, you know, of others who see discrimination, whether it's sexism, whether it's racism, any form of discrimination, to call it out. And, you know, in actually the research tells us this, that one of the problems with an individual saying, you know, if I was in a business situation and I say, look, I think I've been discriminated against in this promotion round because I'm a woman, because in the interview I was asked this and that question and those questions wouldn't have been asked of a man. Of course, people are going to say, well, 
there's an inherent conflict of interest, you know, for me because I didn't get the promotion. So am I calling it out because I'm seriously concerned about sexism or am I calling it out because I'm disgruntled because I didn't get promoted? Whereas if someone else in that process, maybe a man on the panel that is doing the appointment says, you know, we, we in this interview of Julia Gillard asked the following questions. That wasn't right. We shouldn't have asked those questions of her. We didn't ask those questions when John, John and Fred and, you know, mm-hmm. um, Sam came into the room. Why did we ask her about kids or whatever um, the question is? So, you know, I think this is a collective responsibility and the research actually shows, and there's something a little bit galling in this, but it's true, <laughs> that people will listen and take the lessons on board more easily if it's a man who calls out sexism because he is seen to have no inherent conflict of interest. He must be doing it because he genuinely thinks it's right, not because he thinks he's going to get an edge by doing it. So, you know, the message to men out there would be, you know, please get into this. We need you to be into this. (laughs) And it's your responsibility too. And then, Jennifer, your original question, you know, I'd love to be able to say to you, look, um, you know, women women should act any way they want to act. You know, that's mm-hmm. that's exactly what everyone should do. Um, and, and I fundamentally believe that. But as we unpack in the book, in this world, until we create that gender equal world, mm-hmm. um, it's got consequences. And... You know, women should not, um, women should make any judgment call they want to, but um, we shouldn't be naive about those consequences. We should be shining a light on them. So, you know, come a future presidential round, um, if if a woman walked out of the door saying, you should vote for me for to be president of the United States, I've been ambitious to be president of the United States since I was three years old, and you know what, I reckon I'd be really good at it. Um, <laughs> If, if a woman said that, she's not going to get elected. You yeah. and I know that. If you went to work for that candidate, you would be saying, no, 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 yeah. no, <laughs> dial it down. Give a story about how you want to be president of the United States because you really care about the future of the nation's children or whatever. But, yes, you know, you, what we you know yes. you would be saying that to her and that would be, that right. would be great political advice. And, um, you know, we we we've got to be knowing about those complexities. I'm not saying that that woman shouldn't then walk out the door and say, "I've been ambitious to be president since I was three years old." If that's what she wants to say, right. but I wouldn't want her to do that and then go, "How come everybody's gone mad? How come no one's voting for me?" Yeah. Um, you know, we we we've got you know, and this is one of the reasons that we wrote the book. You know, we we in the book. Basically, we're saying to women, make any choice you want to, but, you know, you've got the benefit of having seen this movie before and we know how this movie ends. Um, So, you know, make your choices, forearmed, forewarned, ready to go, not naively. And the, um, I think that I, you know, this is what, this is what I feel like I have to call it out, right? This is why, you know, I, I'm not a candidate for president. So when I saw the women that were running for president be treated differently, I could call it out. But I, I do feel like those of us that are in a position, whether it's to help, um, you know, particularly in America, um, you know, in, in my country, um, it, you know, as a white woman to call this out when it happens to other women, when it happens to people of color in the workplace is really important. You know, if you have the station to do that, I'm old enough that I largely can do that. Or I can go to men and say, you should do this. You should be that partner. But I think that, um, yeah, but women need to understand what they're, what they're walking into. And Gozi, you had something more here. Yeah, no, I, I, I wanted to make sure that um, we don't finish on, on a note <laughs> that is downbeat. Because no, that's the, 
Yeah, that's no. not what this book is about. <laughs> no. <laughs> so I was really, I re- was really concerned about that. I don't know how much longer we have, but we only have a couple more minutes. We have like one okay, question. So, we have so to... tell me what you are. You know, I have some people who have written that they're really excited about. One one person wrote that they're excited because about Gen Z, about young people that are coming up, um, because they feel like that's that they're re- you know that that. Uh, they're very engaged and going to help change, help improve the world. But what do you, what, 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 what word of, uh, what good word of optimism do you want to leave? Yeah, no, no, I, I, I like that comment. I'm also excited about Gen Z because um, they push past it and, Mm -hmm. you know, they don't have all so many of the biases, you know, my, my children or not two are in that generation. So you can see it and it's very refreshing. But what I wanted to say is, look, you know, we the book, uh, the, we want to end on a positive note because we say that in spite of all these problems, leadership is a positive thing, you yes. know, and we really want women to go for it. As Julia said, you know, we want you to be aware of what will be there, but don't take it as, oh, this is so difficult or so down, or I'm going to encounter so many things that I wouldn't do it. No, we're trying to help you indeed do it. So ending on a positive note, I always like to to, to do this. I say, you go girl. <laughs> and you're two women who did it and loved it so much, you wrote a book about why other women should do it too. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. Right. Absolutely. Absolutely. Julia, what would you like to leave us with? And then we'll close it out. No, I, I agree absolutely with what Ngozi just said. And I am uh, very, very inspired by the, the forthcoming generation who I think are understanding of these dilemmas, but they, they're they impatient. You know, they're impatient and they're going to push past it. And they're doing that wonderful thing where uh, they take what have historically been insults and they're they're turning them around into battle cries. Um, One of the (laughs) things, uh, curious things that happened for me is uh, someone sent me a message saying, the misogyny speech is on TikTok. I didn't even know what TikTok was. I had to go and find (laughs) out about TikTok. Um, But it was uh, running because there was a young woman who was getting ready, putting her lipstick on, and she's mouthing the words of the misogyny speech. Uh, but she's got in the in the background a music track, and it's the that track. It's, you, literally, the words are "I'm a bitch, I'm a boss," oh, yeah. and you know they're they're you know the fact that that they're that's the music they're owning that, and they're going to take it out there, and they're going to just say, you know, I am not putting up with any of your nonsense. Here I come, and that's a fantastic thing to say. That is fantastic. That is fantastic. So thank you both. Um, this is the, as I said, my well-worn, well-marked up book, uh, Women Leadership Realize Real Lessons. Thank you both. So it was real, it was, um, Ngozi, it was a real honor to meet you. Julia, it was really great to be able to speak with you again. Um, and we'd like to also like to thank our audience for watching and participating live. If you'd like to watch more programs or support the Commonwealth Club's efforts in making virtual programming, uh, please visit commonwealthclub.org slash online. I'm Jennifer, Jennifer Palmieri. Say thank you um, and stay safe, everyone. Thanks. Thank, thank you, you, Jennifer. Fantastic. Yes, thank, thank you, you Jennifer. Thank you, Great conversation. conversation. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you.